Welcome back to Trending in Education. Dan Trevor, Mike Palmer along with you as we talk about March Madness, but even more importantly, we break down the first round bracket, talk about some of the matchups, what we see moving forward, and what some of these topics may mean the rest of 2020 and beyond. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. It's uh, it's March Madness season on all fronts, and things are getting getting interesting. You know, stuff's getting interesting. Uh, we're recording this right after Super Tuesday has passed, and also interesting in terms of what we're learning from from the audiences, from people weighing in across across the country in the U.S. And it's just an interesting time to try to get a read on what the rest of 2020 is going to be. And we have our sensors out in the universe now in that our polls are live now. You can vote right now. When you're listening to this, you could go to at Trending in Ed on Twitter right now. And you could vote as we're talking. I mean, that's how amazing is that, Dan? It's it's the interactive nature of media today. It, it yes. is. Uh, you, you want it now, you get it now, and you head on over to the, the pinned tweet, the thread over there on our Twitter handle, and you can uh, vote and uh, get your votes in, get your voice heard, as it were. Mike yeah. did say the uh, Super Tuesday, Super Tuesday here in Massachusetts, where I reside, so I got out and, and voted uh, on Tuesday in the primary, so we keep uh, that in mind, we keep March Madness in mind. Rutgers may make the NCAA tournament for the first time since 1991. Wow. Nice. Maryland last night, so oh, much going cool. on. Full disclosure, Dan, you are a Scarlet Knight, correct? I, I am a, a you are an uh, alumni of the, the the Rutgers University of New Jersey. That is correct. I did uh, radio play by play of the sports teams there, so I have a, an affinity for. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But there are topics here in Mike that I think will continue to evolve throughout March, throughout the year, simply because of the way this election might go, the way the economy could go, different things yeah. uh, that are going on as well. Coronavirus uh, has some implications in here as well as it right. continues to be part of the news cycle and part of what uh, the entire world is honestly focusing on uh, yeah. to a great deal uh, as we talk through everything. Yeah, for sure. And we want to help our listeners understand which trends made our list so that, you know, we want an educated electorate out there is basically right. what we're saying. So if, first off, you should follow, at, follow us at, at Trending and Ed find uh, these polls, which we'll be resharing throughout. These polls are going to be open until Monday, and then we'll announce the winners come next uh, next Wednesday when we're at South by Southwest EDU. But we're going to be tracking this stuff all month, and the trends, hopefully the trends that we identified are relevant to folks who want to understand what's happening, what's emerging in learning, media, and education, and, which is what we talk about all the time on the show. So you know, we're hoping that we're able to to keep our finger on the pulse in terms of the collective mojo of our culture through the March Madness in March. And then we're still going to be pumping out some of that regular good stuff, trending in ed, trending in education classic, because that's, that's what people have gotten used to. But then we're going to bring it over the top. And the way we bring it over the top with the March Madness, Dan, I think we're going to have to describe the trends and then understand the matchups and then do a little bit of uh, punditry, a little bit of prognostication, if you will, as far as how we would handicap each of these matches and then figure out whether we were right or wrong downstream. Truth be told, we do have one vote each. Right. So uh, we are also reflecting what we did in terms of our voting uh, preferences. But, uh, but ultimately, it's, it's up to you, uh, particularly if you are up for voting within the, the Twitter polls. Absolutely. And let's, we're going to dive in. We'll go through quickly. The first at the top is applied neuroscience versus flirting. Now, flirting yes. probably needs a tiny bit more explanation than applied neuroscience. But do you want to take this one, Mike, and, and maybe describe quickly what these two topics are about? Yes, absolutely. So applied neuroscience, we uh, recently had an interesting conversation with Andrea Samadhi, uh, who's the host of the Neuroscience Meets Social Emotional Learning Podcast. A really interesting conversation there. We talked about the brain a lot. We talked to Glenn Whitman and Laura Staxberg from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative around NeuroTeach. So just the trend, the broader trend of neuroscience continuing to mature and then figuring out the, the connections between peer-reviewed scientific neuroscience research 
and then the actual application of that in classrooms, in instructional design, in learning interventions, that's applied neuroscience. So I think people probably get that from the name. And then on the other side, we have Flurning, which is a portmanteau, yes. uh, a blending of two words. I've seen it cited in two ways. I'm encouraging the new neologism. So a neo neologism, that's hard to say, uh -huh. but a new version of it. So flirting, lots of times you'll see is learning through failure. So the F stands for failure. I find that to be a little negative take wise. And I have seen some usage and I'm trying to push the usage of having fun while you learn. So bringing the, the fun back into learning. And that's the one that, that I'm, a, I'm a fan of and uh, I'm a proponent of, and I'm, I'm gonna try to push that idea out there a little more. We'll see how, you know, we're not looking past applied neuroscience, Dan. Applied neuroscience is a serious deal. One game at a time. But in terms of like, what I think we all need as an antidote to some of the somberness and the craziness of, uh, of 2020 is a little more bringing the funny, a little more bringing the fun with the learning and having that emotional, positive sentiment with your learning experience. It's motivational and it's a very human connected way of thinking about instructional design. Obviously, it doesn't just have to be fun. Right. You know, you, there are other tones that work. But we've done a bunch of shows on this. We, all, we did a show on bringing humor into the classroom. We've done a number of shows about edutainment. So, so yeah, so hopefully we can start a groundswell of support for learning, having fun while you learn. Well, I, I think it also speaks to uh, play, you know, the return of play in kindergarten and, and younger age groups, uh, pre-K learning. But I'm, I'm on flirting here. I don't want to you know, influence anyone out there in the world, but I do think flirting moves on. We'll see how the voting populace decides to go move on to the next matchup. Yeah, let's do it. Generational zeitgeist, tabloid education. You know, tabloid education really, Mike, grounds into talking about varsity blues and yeah. how... The, the tabloid culture have really intersected with education. These scandals that have broken, these parents trying to get their students into college by bribing and by cheating has become a national story and really pushed education and really higher education into the forefront. Now, what do you make of generational zeitgeist? We talk about generations and the intersectionality of them and yeah. in the workplace and in learning. What does generational zeitgeist mean to you? Yeah, generational zeitgeist, I think, is the idea that there are some passing of the torches, which I talked about, you know, on our last show. The younger generations are rising. It is an election. A lot of the people who are running for office are older baby boomers, and at least in the, the presidential election. And at the counterpoint to that is, you know, the, the, the March for Our Lives, the, the climate movement, right. you know, Greta speaking at the, at the UN uh, while... Donald Trump is there. So like there are these odd juxtapositions in the broader context. And then I think in a, at a very local level, you know, if you're thinking about teaching Generation Z, that requires an awareness of difference and an awareness of context. And the same thing if you're leading an organization, which, you know, has everyone from boomers right on down to Generation Z. So five different generations in the workforce at the same time. I saw recently the New York Times Magazine featured a lot of the new interventions, some of the consulting uh, companies that are emerging that are teaching people uh, how to deal with generational differences, yep. you know, how to be a generational consultant. You know, we did a show recently with Tarlin Ray on the OK Boomer phenomenon. Those sort of macro zeitgeisty collective consciousness kind of things are going to be manifested in each of our lives as we hopefully deal with people not just of our own generation but of other generations because another thing we've talked a lot about on the show is the fact that we're more uh, segmented and segregated by age than uh, than we really have been at any other period in our history and i think it's a time to kind of try to fight back against that trend and i think that's part of the you know, intergenerational diversity is another topic that, that we've talked about on the show. So I think under that broad umbrella, that, that's generally where we're, we're putting generational zeitgeist because we do talk about generational thinking. It's a big part of trending. You know, you want to understand the demographics that are going to happen, especially when you, you're looking, say, five to 10 years out there. 
but uh, but even within this year, particularly because of the election, I think there's going to be a lot of grouping of the electorate, trying to understand who people are based on which generation they fit into. And I think that's going to manifest in anything learning, education uh, related. And then the tablet education, to your point, I think Operation Varsity Blues was kind of the tip of the iceberg, what we've seen so far. And we're going to continue to see scandals, you know, arguably even the way the Department of Education has been covered, you know, has been very sensational. Some of the topics that, you know, the Betsy DeVos and team have chosen to focus on have been almost intentionally provocative. And I think that translates into clicks for education. There's more clickbaity opportunities to talk about the scandalous, sensational stuff that's happening in education. And, you know, voting for tablet ed, I think would say you're expecting that to happen probably more so rather than winding down. So rather than viewing Operation Varsity Blues as, you know, a blip on the radar last year and then it's going to subside, this is sort of saying, it's part of a broader trend and we're going to see more of this type of stuff, more perp walks, you know, and more hot you know, pockets, hot pockets are on trial. Yeah. You know, so we do try to cover this stuff too. So like we're not above going a little tabloid, going a little clickbaity because that is part of the the broader culture. So if, if you're interested in that, you're expecting that to grow more. I think it winds up being an interesting matchup because I think there's some appeal to both options. Yep, I think that'll be a fun one to track as we roll through. Let's go next to Robo Revolution and the learning workforce. The learning workforce, the idea, correct me if I'm wrong from your perspective, Mike, that we are always learning as part of a workforce and growing and, and how our employers doing this one-off education, trying to understand growth potential and year over year, how we're growing our workforce and making sure they stay learning and educated in different ways. And Robo Revolution robots, man. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're continuing yeah. to be a part of education. Totally. And the Robo Revolution is partly a nod to Holland IQ, who did a really interesting Education 2030 report that we did a podcast about. And I did. I subsequently went to a conference that Holland sponsored that we did another show on. And at a macro level, in terms of like venture capital and innovation in learning and education, the idea that robots, artificial intelligence, machine learning. You know, we've already retired artificial intelligence proper as a topic, but we love talking about robots. Westworld season three is about to start in, yep. in March. So I think that will give us an opportunity to get back into the pop culture side. But all of it is thinking about how robots and automation and AI will continue to take on tasks and responsibilities and adopt skills that historically have been exclusively human and that that revolution is going to force us to think about what does that mean to educators and what does that mean to uh, learners so so that's the robo revolution side of things and then i think you're right on the, the learning workforce it's also tied to a really interesting ed surge article we may wind up doing a show we'll at least uh, share it out where one of the trends they talked about is education is the new healthcare. One of the benefits that potential employees would seek out when looking to be hired is what kind of healthcare package does this organization have? Do I want to work for them for, by, by virtue of those benefits? The learning workforce is talking about how new employees across the generational spectrum, across whatever ways in which folks identify, will increasingly expect learning and upskilling and being educated to be something that an employer is going to have to provide. Otherwise, they're going to go elsewhere. And despite the robo-revolution, there will continue to be a need for humans who can be reskilled, retooled. We talked about this recently. You know, humans are much better rapidly learning somewhat ill-structured solutions where AI and the robo revolution is going to require a lot more training, training of data. So humans are going to have a huge role in the workforce, but the humans who are relevant are the ones who are learning. So if you're not learning, you're probably going to be out of a job soon, you know, just because the, the, there's no longer the luxury of, I figured out this thing 20 years ago, I bring my lunch bucket to the office, and I do the same thing the way I've done it for the last 20, 30 years. Those are the folks who are most at risk. And I think they're actually hit on both sides of this particular matchup. You know, like 
if you're not part of the learning workforce, you're in trouble. So wake up and start learning. And then on the other side, if not, the, the wave of the fourth industrial revolution, the robo revolution that we're starting to see is going to start to impact you, particularly if you're doing the types of things that, that robots might get good at. And, and yeah, Westworld, uh, Westworld season three uh, is on the horizon. So that'll be fun to talk about. It will be. I see what Dolores does next. We have up next one that was a late entry to this year's bracket because of the news at large with the coronavirus. But we have decision education, a call back to Annie Duke and, and the idea of teaching people how to make proper decisions. We've talked about it separate from Annie Duke as well, but that episode uh, rings yeah. true here. And bunker-based yep. learning. So you and I were yeah. talking, I think last week, off the cuff around the idea that if this coronavirus or any sort of global event happens, uh, we're yeah. going to have to see a way for people to continue to learn, but in a very yeah. specific at-home environment that they're not choosing to have. They're not choosing to, they are forced into, rather opting into, and, and being in yeah. a bunker mentality when it comes to learning as yeah. well. How does this matchup break down for you? Yeah, pretty much the way the way you're lining it up. So, you know, Annie Duke wrote a book called Thinking in Bets, did an interview with her, Annie Duke, you know, former professional uh, poker player, World Series uh, of Poker Champion, Heads Up Tournament Champion. So a very established uh, professional poker player, wrote a book about decision making called uh, Thinking in Bets. I think she has a new book on the horizon. So maybe we'll get a uh, shout out to, to Annie. Hopefully we'll get Annie back because it's a real interesting idea decision education in particular talking about bringing that to k-12 the ideas themselves i think are emerging more in the lifelong learning you know folks who read books folks who are you know day-to-day -day, like if you're a trader or you're an executive the idea of decision science decision education it is something that is i think more prevalent probably in you know leadership development and workforce development but what Annie and the Decision Education Alliance or the Alliance for Decision Education is the, is the name of the, the, the organization, the not-for-profit that, that, that Annie has, has founded, they're very much focused on bringing good decision science, which is a combination of good probabilistic thinking, uh, scenario-based thinking, some behavioral economics, like understanding where humans are rational or irrational, uh, and just trying to be somewhat dispassionate and critical when you think about how you make decisions and then adopt good practices to learn from everything you do along the way. So really fascinating stuff. Honestly, on a personal level, it was, it's been very impactful to how I think about navigating my life, thinking about being smart about making decisions on the one hand, but draws a killer matchup. You know, like for me, bunker-based learning came together, probably one of the last entries that we did add to the brackets, in part because of the coronavirus, but I mean, more broadly, even if you think about Netflix and chill, which, which I know means something else, I'm, you know, it's a, we'll try to keep it clean here. But, but the idea of like Netflix and learn, you know, like give me some time in my safe place because the world outside is scary. You know, I imagine among the many mental health challenges that we're facing as a broader culture, even globally, one of the new ones I think will be like a social phobia epidemic. So in addition to the coronavirus going viral and spreading everywhere, I think the, the, the tendency to stay, you know, stay inside your house and not deal with anybody face to face, that's a trend that I don't think is going to go away. And arguably, it's becoming more rational to, to be able to dial that up when you need to, which means everybody's going to be thinking about what do I need to have stockpiled so that I'm ready. And in addition to, you know, your Purell, your bottled water, you may also need your, your learning syllabi. So like, what am I actually going to accomplish when I'm home? Increasing that employers are encouraging their workforce to work remotely. And in some ways, that's the same trend. Same thing with schools. Interestingly, the schools are canceling classes. But I think increasingly, you know, maybe within within the next year might be a bit of a stretch, but I think we're going to hear more about folks who forego face-to-face -face in person right. and instead develop some corollary programming that is live online or just online in some capacity. Because it does seem like there's a critical period when the coronavirus could spread 
more aggressively in particular geographies right. and that if folks really just kind of weather the storm, batten down the hatches, try to do more nautical, a vast ye mateys. But, uh, but I think bunker-based learning may also extend beyond the, the coronavirus because I think there's a lot of a lot of stuff in the breaking news, you know, media industrial hype cycle. There's a lot of things that encourage you to be afraid. Like, you know, just, just watch the, the evening news and it, it makes you question whether it makes sense to go outside. And then if, if you can get everything shipped to your home, you can develop your, your sort of learning cave to, to optimize learning. I think bunker-based learning is, uh, is a trend that may have some legs, even though those legs may be hiding in the bunker. Very good. As we continue, uh, teachers as leaders, gamer ed, we've talked about teachers running for office, teachers leading the, the charge uh, when it comes to policy changes, striking teachers, marching on their state capitals or even on Washington, D.C. So that one makes a lot of sense as uh, yeah. the, the election is here, but also just gaining momentum as teachers realize their voice yeah. and what they need to do to, to speak up for themselves and their students. And gamer yeah. ed, is an interesting take here too, because not specifically gamification, uh, gamifying learning, but more the space of gamers and how we might learn and how we might go about understanding one, their world, but also how we might learn through the process of streaming and gamer sharing and the sort of yes. esports ecosystem. Yes. Yeah, well said. And I, and I think on that one, I think Gamer Ed drew a tough matchup where teachers as leaders, like it all harkens back to our first March Madness where AI and the importance of teachers tied. But I think the idea that teachers, regardless of whether they are formally designated as leaders in what they do, the reality is they are leaders. They, they are in the front of a classroom leading the development of, of the next generation or generations or humans that they're in contact with. And that is a leadership position. So I think it's a little bit of a reframing of the role and and i think it's going to be tough to really beat back the rising tide of let's recognize that teachers are providing a fundamental service to our society and that we haven't been giving them their due i think there will be a ton of that heading into the election i think we will be talking more in depth you know what educational policies are actually in play this year that are going to potentially bubble up since it is an election year and, and I think throughout, there will be a nod to bringing teachers into the political process, bringing teachers into the, the, the halls of industry, and et cetera, et cetera, where, you know, another trend we talk about a lot is inclusion, you know, being more inclusive of teachers and allowing them to lead and recognizing that they already do lead. So that's more central, I think, to what our listeners typically might focus on. You never know. You know, gamer ed, I think, is a real trend, and it's something we're going to continue to track. But I just don't think it, I don't think it tugs at the heartstrings quite so much as teachers as leaders. So, so we'll see. We'll see how that matchup plays out. I need a, a, a pronunciation check here on creativity. What are we going here with? Creativity. Creativity. There you go. And ed edutainment. <laughs> FTW for the win. We talked about education yeah. earlier in this episode uh, as yeah. we discussed through some of the topics. Uh, what do you what do you got in these two? How do you describe them? And and do you think uh, edutainment has the legs to take down a higher seed? It's a good question, and this is also where the language got a little wacky. But but creativity is something we talk about a ton, yeah. and AI is something we talk about a ton. I love portmanteaus. I don't know if this is technically a portmanteau because you kind of jam an AI in the middle of creativity. So I don't know if you have to be front part one word, back part the other word. But regardless, it's a blending of two words. We had a really interesting show, a couple of shows recently, talking about how human creativity is likely to outstrip artificial intelligence in its ability to be creative, novel, innovative for likely the next 10 years. And what this talks about is both that reality, the idea that AI will be better at certain things, humans will be better at certain things, creativity is one of the things humans will be better at, but it's also the idea that a creative human who can leverage AI will actually be providing more transformative solutions than the creative human who is uh, refusing to connect with the Borg 
you know? So it's sort of the idea that blending AI into the more creative aspects of human endeavors will unlock unrealized potential at a much more accelerated rate. So we'll see whether creativity is the answer or not. It may take more practice, but, but on, and then on the other side, who's the other matchup here? Edutainment FTW. For the win. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a tough matchup for edutainment, but we did a show right around when we were at sound education that performed really well, which is that edutainment is not a bad word. So it's not all caps, a bad word and got a good response. You know, I think there is, you know, the way people, the charge of words evolve over time and even the way people think about bringing learning to other media experiences, other traditional, you know, leisure and entertainment contexts. It's honestly something we do try to do on this show. Like we do try to educate folks, but we try to have fun while we do it. And, uh, and yeah, so edutainment for the win, maybe they win this matchup, but, but I think it, it might be tough, a tough draw. And we'll see though, Cree AI-tivity, the language may be so awkward that people just gravitate to the one that has an FTW next to it. So, so we'll see how that goes, but, uh, but we'll continue to be covering these types of topics uh, on trending in education in the future. And we turn our attention here to the bottom of the bracket where we have equity and belonging versus 2020 vision. We talked about equity, talked about the idea of diversity and inclusion, equity and belonging, a little bit more of a a step forward, even beyond diversity and inclusion. 2020 vision implies so many things and it is to an extent just how much of 2020 and beyond is in the learning landscape, in the education landscape, but also how much of what will happen this year across multiple things, not just the election, but multiple decisions made, multiple changes uh, potentially in our government and beyond. Is that how you see it? Do you see any add-ons or or extras you can add to these two topics? And do you have a a winner here? Uh, Yeah, well, I I think 2020 vision is is certainly interesting. We've been talking about it on the show for since 2018, 2019, starting to look ahead and realize 2020 by virtue of the number is going to beg for people who have vision, people who have perspective on a longer term horizon. And I think the idea here is that a 2020 vision for learning and for education will move an individual, an organization, a, a, a mission to the front of the line. And I think so that's one aspect of it. And I think the other is that we are desperately looking for anyone really on the political side to let us know that they have a sense of where we need to go as a a country, as a broader global economy that will ultimately leverage learning, understand the the right policies for education. So, So I think that's 2020 vision is sort of a nod to that. And it's also recognition that 2020 will require folks to think more critically about civic engagement, think more critically about voting, about uh, how governments work, how money influences government, and how individuals and their vision for the future ultimately may rise to the top. That's at least the hope. So it's somewhat somewhat aspirational. And then who, who are we matched up against there with 2020 Vision? Uh, the matchup for this one for 2020 vision is equity and belonging. And that's kind of like the next level thinking around diversity and inclusion, which you talked about. So, you know, I've heard it characterized as diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, but belonging, which we, we had an interesting show with Melissa uh, about a month or so ago, talking about uh, whether implicit bias uh, training actually works. And that's where belonging came up where, frequently the way in which diversity, equity, and inclusion is delivered is not really uh, something that the, the groups that it's targeting, so protect potentially the minority groups, uh, diverse, in- inclusive groups, don't necessarily feel like they have a sense of ownership and belonging to the culture. So if your diversity and inclusion, implicit bias training is done for your people of color, people in diverse groups, rather than by them and through them, it's not really gonna work. And the whole idea of belonging, I think, is, is a bigger concept as well, where it's, you know, you could be inclusive, 
but if you're including folks and you're not really allowing them to to lead and own you're not genuinely being inclusive so i think the idea is a next level mode of diversity and inclusion training that is less about doing things for folks who traditionally haven't been included and instead is empowering them to it reminds me a little bit of the teachers as leaders it's like can you can you really see the control to the groups who need to have that sense of belonging you know in the context of higher education frequently folks from other countries are coming to a u.s university folks from like the the kaplan foundation we've done a number of shows with nancy uh, sanchez there those students maybe they, they they're transfer students with with an associate's degree what can be done to make them feel as as much a sense of belonging and ownership of the culture as traditional students who come in through through the standard pipelines so hopefully it's a topic that we'll continue to cover on the show and we'll see how people wind up voting on the polls we go next to digital inclusion and employer you not to confuse digital inclusion with equity and belonging, more the idea of access to digital and access to uh, internet and and ability to learn online here. We had a great conversation early September, I believe, around digital equity and the like, and really understanding how uh, individual communities can rally and understand uh, children in their own town or city, how they have access to, should a student have to go to Starbucks to do their homework or anything of that like? Or should they have better access at home or in the classroom to uh, internet and internet-based learning? And Employer U is here and mentioned this one earlier as we talk through uh, the idea of the learning workforce. This more about the specific idea of a college degree through your employer, I believe, Mike, t- again, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea of going pro early, what we've seen from the Walmarts and the Starbucks of the world in really driving home the idea of an education being tied to your employment, cheaper education, free education, whatever it might be. This is a great one. This is a, a first round matchup that probably could have been a final four matchup when, when we really think about the way uh, learning is going in 2020 and beyond. How do you see this one? Yeah, I mean, Employer U is a nod to Brandon Bustide, who's a great follow on LinkedIn, a colleague uh, of ours. He's, he's certainly an interesting thinker, uh, Frank Britt, who from Penn Foster, who I interviewed a couple of months ago, also was thinking about the idea of learning to work and working to learn, you know, so the idea that education has a benefit, you know, I talked about earlier, I think that's a, that's going to be an interesting thing for us to track. Digital inclusion, also Angela Seifer's work, we did a really interesting show there, certainly one to, to dig into. Moving quickly here through the rest of the brackets, there is a matchup between simu learning and AR VR in the classroom, which I think is an interesting matchup in that simu learning is learning through simulations and AR VR in the classroom is using AR and VR in the classroom. Those two are pretty similar and related ideas. Frequently when you think about a simulation, one of the ways in which you'll deliver a simulation is through AR slash VR. Simu learning might be a slightly bigger idea the idea that rather than traditional uh, multiple choice questions or summative assessments, what if we could give learners an opportunity to explore what the experience might be like in advance of actually being exposed to it? Uh, I just think it's an interesting matchup in that the two topics are uh, pretty closely interrelated. We'll see which one wins out. And now for the final three matchups in the bracket, uh, which I'm going to try to move through quickly. And thanks again for listening. Cyber learning versus new media literacies. So cyber learning, we talked to Simone Petrella and the team from Cyber Vista recently about the skills gap that's emerging around cybersecurity and around how new economy skills are going to continue to surface as we try to educate our workforces. And it's going to require new thinking about how to close those gaps and new ways to continue to educate and develop your workforce to keep them cutting edge and relevant as skills and broad domains continue to be disrupted. And it's another place where I think the importance of softer skills and ways in which to understand the domains in which you're providing cybersecurity or data science training 
other emerging uh, new economy skills. That's a trend that we've been seeing. It's a trend that we expect to continue to see. It's matched up against new media literacies. We had a really interesting conversation about Doug Belshaw's work on digital literacy. And a lot of that involves understanding how to how to make sense of the complexities of the internet and of the the emerging media capabilities that are constantly bombarding us with information, some of which is valid, much of which is confusing and complicated and potentially fake. So really interesting work by Doug Belshaw and great work being done by Cyber Vista at Cyber Learning. Those shows are in our back catalog. They're worth checking out and not really sure where we're going to land here. We'll have to keep an eye on that matchup. Two more matchups to go. Mindful learning versus fanocracy. Mindful learning is the idea that the mindfulness movement, which has seen the emergence of apps like Calm and others. Also, we we have talked to folks who have written books about the relevance of mindfulness and restorative time to uh, reflect and get organized about your thinking. That's a trend that uh, I think may have legs. It's up against fanocracy, and we did have a really interesting conversation with David Meerman Scott earlier in January of this year to talk about his new book, which is talking about how brands and individuals and educators can really benefit from thinking about building engagement and building a following by empowering fans and establishing practices that drive fandom and also seed some of the top-down authority to the power of your fans. Really interesting conversation with David. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, we'll see how it fares versus mindful learning. And then last but not least, we have a matchup between Jomo, aka The Joy of Missing Out, a, a late entry last year that did quite well and we wanted to give it another shot. It's a nice counterpoint to FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. This is more saying, I know I'm missing this thing and I'm comfortable with that. And I'm somewhat intentional about choosing not to engage and the liberating power that the individual finds by choosing to miss out is a really interesting counterpoint. We'll see how that trend fares this year. It's matched up against the idea that audio is the new video. So we did attend at the Sound Education Conference up in Boston had a really interesting conversation, had an opportunity to be on a panel up there. I think the idea that video may have oversaturated the the marketing marketplace, may have been overpromised by folks like Mark Zuckerberg and others as transformative and fundamental, when slowly but surely and steadily throughout, we have seen the emergence of podcasting, voice assistance, platforms like Spotify, platforms like Luminary. We've talked a bit about a platform uh, called Himalaya. They're all beginning to emerge to begin to deliver things as audio, understanding that in a world where screens are so predominant and so consuming of our attention, that modes of delivery that don't necessarily rely as much on screens will provide new capabilities to learners and to smart educators who can provide products and services leveraging the emerging power of audio. So again, thank you for bearing with us. There's plenty of things to choose from. Follow us at at Trending and Ed. You can vote on polls there. You can also make predictions about how the tournament is going to play forward. We'll continue to be tracking this throughout March. In effect, we've given you our top 28 trends to track with seeding. So that's a nice list to take a look at. And beyond just being a list, it's a list that will be squaring off against itself as we continue to refine the field and ultimately arrive at a single winner, which is the trending in education zeitgeisty learning trend to watch in 2020. It's going to be a lot of fun. And thanks again for listening. We'll be back again soon on trending in education. 